Good afternoon and welcome to another Ontario Good Roads Association webinar. My name is Thomas Barricat and I'm the Manager of Public Policy and Government Relations. As today's moderator, I'd like to thank Partum Consulting for partnering with us to bring you this webinar today. Before we begin, I'd like to encourage you to ask questions uh, of our experts today. Feel free to submit questions via the Q&A button or the Q&A box at any time during the presentation. We answer questions via the Q&A chat throughout the presentation, and we're also gonna save some for the end as well. I'm joined by Lillianne Louis from Partum. Lillianne has been in the railway industry for more than 10 years. She began her career working for the Canadian Pacific Railway, where she managed third-party crossing uh, and bridge projects. Her resume also includes work with Transport Canada as a railway works engineer. She now consults for railways, road authorities, and contractors on railway safety. Lillianne has inspected over 1,000 crossings in Ontario and Quebec for safety compliance and whistle cessation. She's fluent in the legal requirements of at-grade crossings and their practical applications in the field. Secondly, also from Partum Consulting, is Daniel Goodfellow. Daniel is uh, the operations director, and he has been in the construction industry for more than a decade. He has extensive experience in contract planning, execution, and negotiation, which allows him to lead with a holistic understanding of project needs. Daniel has been involved with great crossing inspections and also acts as a reliable resource to railway clients for project management activities. And with that, welcome uh, Lillian and Daniel, it's over to you. Yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Thomas. Um, and I guess just a quick introduction for uh, for Partum Consulting as well is we are uh, engineering and project management consultants and we've been specifically focusing on um, grade crossing assessments and being a subject matter expert for uh, many railroads in the area and that's kind of what has brought us to the, here today with this uh, with this presentation. So um, we'll outline a, a quick agenda that we're going to go over today. We're going to go over uh, the goal of this presentation. We're going to go over the overview of what uh, railway grade crossings are, some legal authorities and some useful resources for you, uh, responsibilities at railway grade crossings. Um, we're going to go over an evaluation uh, case study and some existing crossings. We're going to talk about some grant funding and uh, some type of stuff that's available for you there. And we have a focus topic on whistle cessation. And then at the end, we'll summarize up any questions or any, uh, any comments that we get throughout the presentation. So the goal of the presentation, mainly to educate and, and, uh, and raise awareness. So educate road authorities on the railway grade crossing safety and all of the legal responsibilities. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, um, you'll know the legal authorities and who they are and how to access resources. You'll know your legal responsibilities. Uh, you'll know what to consider when you're evaluating your current existing crossings and how to access grant funding and safety improvements. We'll talk about some whistle cessation and a, and a focus topic at the end. Um, and we know that there's, there's many topics and uh, concerns out there that you may have that we won't be covering in this presentation. Uh, we have some of them listed there on the far right. Um, if you do have any concerns or would like to talk about any, anything else, um, by all means, reach out to us. Uh, after this, and Lillian and I would have to be happy to uh, to walk you through any of that stuff. So an overview. So an overview on grade crossings. So grade crossings are your level intersections between passive trains and roadways. Track types, usually you'll see your freight rail, your industrial spur lines, your passenger rail and local lines. Uh, for roadways, there's the public roadway accesses, the designated trails, uh, your private and business accesses and the farm lanes. And what we want to go over in this presentation is, is the shared responsibility between the railway companies and the road authorities. Okay. So let's go over some typical crossings. So generally um, your automated crossings are generally the crossings that have heavy roadway or railway traffic. Uh, a cross product greater than 2000. So, and how we create that cross product number is, is it's the number of traffic in a day uh, multiplied against the number of trains in a day. 
and we just multiply them together. And if it's a greater number than 2000, chances are we're dealing with an automated crossing. Um, automated being uh, similar to the images here, flashing lights and bell, flashing lights and bell with gates, and your flashing lights and bell with gates and, uh, and an overhead cantilever. Usually you see that on multiple lanes or high speed uh, uh, roadways where some obstruction of view could be obstructed on, uh, on multiple lanes with heavy trucks or whatnot. And then we'll get into the next slide here, which shows us um, the passive crossings. So generally crossings with lower roadway or lower railway traffic, cross product less than 2000, get to your public passive ways. So that's just your regular stop sign and cross bucks. Um, private dwellings, which is three or less dwellings on the opposite side of the tracks as a private dwelling and um, and your farm access as well. So your field to field or your seasonal farm access where uh, farm equipment is going to need to uh, cross over the tracks to get into different fields. So the next slide is going to be uh, we're, we're going to show you some of some of the the incident statistics that exist in Ontario. So of the 4600 grade crossings in Ontario. Um, the grade crossings in Ontario represent roughly 21% of the total crossings in Canada, and they represent roughly 27% of crossing accidents in Canada. And if you, if I can uh, bring everybody's attention to figure three, the, the, the chart on the far right, um, the dark brown indicates the, uh, the crossing accidents over the last say 10 years here. And you'll see that there's no real, no real trend to this. Um, it's kind of sporadic year after year. And if we zero in our focus on say the last five years, it's technically even trending upwards uh, with more crossing accidents. Um, so realistically, we need to get uh, our focus on getting this trending downwards, having less crossing accidents, um, newer technologies, uh, newer types of compliance and stuff like that. So there's a question here about why is Ontario relatively higher by volume on accidents? So that could be due to population density um, and knowing that we have a lot of railway crossings in our urban areas. So there's many different factors that could do this. Um, I see Rishi are even saying for a proportion of crossings, cultural norms and issues. That's correct. Well, like Ontario, you know, out of all of Canada, we have the most sort of urban type uh, population and a lot of the rails co are going through our city. So that could be one of the many factors. And I think second in line to us is sort of the prairie regions. And they also have a lot of crossings due to all the farm and grain um, sort of industries that are out there. So many factors there, but it is, you know, for us, this is why we're interested to provide you with this presentation to know that yeah, our province is, is contributing a lot to those accidents and we, we hope to educate um, some safety improvements that road authorities can think about to help bring those numbers down. Nice, nice. Okay, thanks Lillian. Okay, so our next slide. Okay, so legal authorities and some useful resources for you. So um, lots of references here. So as far as federal regulation authorities go, you have your Canadian Transportation Agency, these are the people that are the ownership and the, and the maintenance and the rates uh, along the rail. Your Transport Canada. So Transport Canada, these are the people in the field that you're going to see um, upholding the Railway Safety Act and the legislation and also enforcement. The Transportation Safety Board. So uh, these are the people um, that will be handling incident investigations, gathering accident statistics like the, like the previous slide that we just showed you. When it comes to safety and design, uh, we've got our three points. So when it comes to the law itself, we have the Transport Canada's grade crossing regulations, the grade crossing standards, and the grade crossing handbook. For standards, we have Transportation Association of Canada, and we have the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Guidelines, um, another good resource is, is your Federation of Canadian Municipalities and Railway Associations of Canada. So RAC is what we call it. So there's there's quite a few um, different reference points here. We've got some, uh, some attachments and some hyperlinks near the end of the presentation. Uh, good information, uh, it's scattered throughout a lot of these, 
a lot of these different uh, avenues. So, so we'll we'll put that all up in a, in a simpler form for you. Responsibilities. Okay, so let's get into responsibilities. So the grade crossing regulations and legal expectations here is this has been a phased in approach since 2014 and it's fully set in force this November, November of this year. And what it does is it outlines the roles and responsibilities for the sharing of information between road authorities and railway crossings and, and railway um, companies. So what we're calling the four S's is, is your, your surfaces, your sight lines, your signage, and your signals. And, it's, and it mainly talks about the, the sharing of information amongst these. Okay, moving forward. So information sharing for the railway. So what the railway owes to the, to the road authority as far as information goes, it, it's listed here, stuff like the railway design speed, the warning system that's in place. Uh, railways are going to be doing their own assessments, compiling the data and, and presenting it to the road authority uh, for information. And this is all collected through crossing assessments. Now the road authority uh, has its own list of items that it needs to do assessments on and keep track of. Stuff like your road crossing design speed, your design vehicle, uh, crossing angle, all the stuff listed here, and as well as changes and updates as well as, uh, as the municipalities progress through, through information. So we're, we're gonna be gathering all of this information, compiling it into a similar report and providing that to the railway. Okay, so legal responsibilities for the railway. So we won't touch on, on, uh, on this as in detail, but we tried to illustrate with this illustration on the right here, um, items that are X'd out, which is for the, for the roadway and the, the road authority that we'll get into next. Um, but basically keeping track of the sight lines, the surfaces, the signage and the signals, as well as some, uh, some overall best practices like snow removal, fencing along the railway if there's a high um, trespassing uh, number and stuff like that. A lot of the signage is listed there too that they'll be maintaining and keeping track of. <clears throat> Road authority. So the legal requirements, um, we did our best to illustrate. Uh, so there's specific trees and sight lines to maintain uh, to make sure that the Road authorities signage is visible and seeable and um, and a lot of the road access is is also um, maintained one one important note is is the railway will be in charge of the surface between the two rails um, but if there's multiple tracks the road authority will be in charge of maintaining the the road surface between those tracks other things listed there as well okay Okay, so com compliance timeline. So what we've tried to do is we've put this into uh, a, sh a reference sheet um, that you can reference at a later date. Feel free to use this. This is basically the responsibility of rail or railway or road authority and uh, breaking it down from sight lines, surfaces, signage and signals and the compliance timeline. So some of it is should currently be compliant as of present day and some of it is, is uh, coming up this November uh, 2021, and then some good best practices in there as well. So you'll see um, the railway does have more responsibilities than the road authority, and we've done our best to kind of capture um, the, the compliance where we have to work together with railways and road authorities, for example, sight lines, ensuring that the visibility on approaching trains and also approaching traffic is kind of a, a shared responsibility to make sure that um, both parties uh, have good visible sight lines when, when approaching a crossing. So feel free to use this, this table at a later date uh, if, it, if it's helpful on, on uh, going over your responsibilities and splitting the, the, uh, the responsibility between both parties. Okay, and I'm gonna hand it over to Lillian now. She's gonna go over a case study on current existing crossings and uh, some useful information on that for you. Okay, so thank you, Dan. So 
That was sort of the first half where you can find the black and white, what is legal requirement, and some also some safety best practices that we've seen over the years um, at crossings. So the next portion of the presentation is kind of like a guide for road authorities. If you're looking to consider the current crossings that you have, what are some of the legal requirements and some of the safety best practices that you should consider? So when it comes to the regulations, it's definitely more heavy on the railways and legal requirements for their um, safety was quite specific for them. But for road authorities, it's more on best practices because it comes into things like TAC and the MUTCD, which isn't really railway related. It's more of a road authority standard. So you're gonna notice in the next slides that they'll be more heavy on the safety best practices um, for you to consider for your existing crossings. So we'll start um, just by reiterating that if you are looking for the black and white requirements for existing crossings, the document to go to is the grade crossing standards. And the standards do also provide um, design, installation, and maintenance requirements for even new crossings, which are rare these days, but um, those standards can also be used as a best practice for your existing crossings. But it's really that section or that part B in the GCS that'll say what the minimum requirements are uh, for existing grade crossings. And then also for the purpose of this presentation to let you know that if you are interested in whistle cessation, there is an appendix in the GCS that explains the requirements for a crossing um, if you're looking to get uh, a whistle cessation at that point. And also the regulations and standards, to be honest, I think I've been reading this thing for more than five years and it can be confusing to link what the regulation says to the standard and Transfer Can has been super helpful. They've created this handbook and it's really here where if you are reading the standard and you're like, okay, this is what needs to happen. Does this need to happen now? Or how do I meet this? The handbook does elaborate. So this is definitely a great place to be. You can also give us a call too. Like we're happy to talk and help you as every crossing I say is like a snowflake. So it's hard to decide what's uh, needed at each crossing, but this is a great resource, the handbook to really, that really explains the regulations and the standards. Okay, so let's just jump right into it. Um, if you are considering doing assessments for your current crossings, uh, the first thing to always think about are the sight lines. Um, so the legal requirements are in Article 7 of the Grade Crossing Standards, and sight lines are the first defense at a crossing. Being able to see that up oncoming train, being able to see the flashing lights, and any advance warning signals, those are the first line of defense to really protect any crossing user. Um, so this figure is taken from the grade crossing standards, and this really applies to crossings that do, are not automated without a gate. So you could, this could somewhat apply to also crossings that just have the flashing light and bell without the gate, but you can see it, it illustrates two different types of sightline triangles, we call them, and the distances of these triangles for example, figure 71A. So this is a sightline triangle where we assume the crossing user is stopping, meaning there is a stop sign underneath that cross book. Um, this is the size and that area of the sightline um, that needs to be clear. That's a photo of if you were a crossing user looking into that quadrant for that sightline triangle, what it should look like. It's clear there's no trees in the way if the train is coming at that certain D stop distance, which is based on the train speed. Um, we should be able to see it. So that's a good clear crossing. Okay. And actually there's a good, there's a good question that just popped up in the chat, Lillian. Okay. Um, so if there is an issue with a sight line, is the respective party required to notify the other and can a bill be sent to the other party without notice? This is a good question. So the CTA in the Canadian Transportation Act or is the Railway Safety Act, I forgot which one, it does say that for safety reasons, uh, the railway does have the right to cut vegetation. So I'm wondering if this is a question out of experience. <laughs> so they can, it can be seen that if there is a physical obstruction of trees or so that is affecting the sightline requirements, that it is a safety concern and it can be cut. And I'm sure like it, it's pretty sad that over the years there hasn't been that communication. And I, I, I you know, when I worked at CP, I know there's been road authorities that sort of got to, bills for things surprisingly um and it's more 
it might have been an emergency situation or the safety might have been really bad so they had to do that but there are, it does mention in the act that that ability to do so so hopefully that answers the question and then the figure 71b below shows a typical sightline triangle for crossings that just have the crosswalk or the standard railway crossing sign that SRCS um, if you don't have a stop, the triangle, as you can see, is much larger and those distances of the SSD along the roadway and the DSSD along the track, same thing, they're calculated based on the design vehicle, the speed of the road, the design speed of the, of the track. So just to give you an idea what a much larger sightline triangle that must be to be able to keep this whole area clear of any sort of obstruction. So it's quite a bit of maintenance sight lines for those for those crossings and then some safety best practices for sight lines so things that are not really listed in the regulations but that do apply to crossing safety and for for road authorities to really consider uh, the first point there is to ensure that vegetation along the roadway right of way does not obstruct those advanced warning signs so in that bottom right photo you see there's that railway advanced warning sign like literally in a bush, there's many of those that I've seen, but you can see here the road authority has trimmed the bush around so that um, if I am a crossing user, I do still have visibility. You know, it could be trimmed a bit better, but you know, there is that maintenance requirement. That's the point of that best practice, just to keep an eye on these advanced warning signs. Um, another best practice is just say that you are faced with a crossing that has no stop sign. It's that larger um, sightline triangle. And you're having trouble keeping it clear due to crop um, growth or maybe there's trees on a private land the owner's not interested in cutting them down there are strategies to reduce that sightline triangle from the one being shown there that larger one too you could consider if it makes sense to put a stop sign at the crossing if you think that people will actually stop right there are always those soft um, conditions as well as well that might um, affect whether a stop sign is effective. Um, you could also consider reducing the roadway design speed that would also reduce the size of that sightline triangle. Um, but again, every crossing is different. These are just some things to consider. And then finally, the last point is just to reiterate that a best practice at all crossings is to apply conservative crossing conditions when you're calculating the sightlines. So there's a formula in the standards. Again, if you need help with any of that, give us a call. We can kind of walk you through it. Also, the grade crossing handbook definitely goes through sort of how to go through that calculation. But from a road authority's perspective, the I think one of the most important things that a road authority decides for a crossing is the design vehicle. And in the handbook, it says that road authorities should consider what's the most frequently um, what's the most frequent passive passage over the crossing, that should be the design vehicle. Um, but in my experience, depending on where you are, if there is school buses or even city buses that pass that crossing, um, especially for crossings that are automated with gates, the selection of that design vehicle can really affect the timing of the gate, which can also affect the safety of the crossing in general. So it's not so simple to just say, because I've seen a lot of this in the sharing of information, road authorities saying, oh, my design vehicle is a passenger car. And they apply that to all their crossings. Um, doing that with an automated crossing with gates, even though there's buses there, can really cause additional safety issues. So it's really important to understand how to select that design vehicle. Um, you know, there are there are resources out there to help you really understand that and you can even we've worked the calculations uh, the railway kit is also a, you know i know sometimes they're hard to get a hold of but they're a great resource if you are having trouble at an automated crossing you know try to try to find some strategies to make it, the timings a bit better and the crossings a bit more safe okay so moving on to the second s is surface so the legal requirements for existing crossings is just for it's pretty vague the, the actual words are that it's a smooth and continuous surface and um, you know when inspectors are out there looking to see if a crossing is smooth and continuous they really just see whether a crossing user if they're slowing down before they cross the crossing that could be an indication that it's not smooth and continuous and requires some sort of re remediation 
from a road authority's point of view, it's really just the approaches and that surface between tracks, if there's multiple tracks that a road authority is responsible for. Um, I do know the railways do collaborate with road authorities to, to remediate the surface in between tracks, just because practically speaking, they'll have to take care of the surface between the rails. So sometimes, you know, they're kind enough to work together and kind of remediate that middle section as well. But um, really that's the legal requirement uh, for a surface at this time. Um, that second bullet point talks about for new or modified crossings, the allowable approach, approach gradients. And almost like as, as a legal slash best practice, just wanted to know those gradient limits are in the GCS, a consideration at some crossings. So if you notice that some of the roadway approaches for the crossings in your municipalities, some of them have steep approaches. Um, and if maybe you're gonna be widening that road in the future, if you can also sort of make the approach smoother um, to try to meet the standard to as close as you can, that's always a good uh, best practice and a way to improve the safety at a, at a crossing. And then some safety best practice concepts for the surface as well um, is to consider the type of crossing surface um, for maintenance and ride quality. So maybe you have a lot of crossings like the bottom right hand corner that are just always so hard to maintain and the surface is not smooth and continuous. Um, I would recommend consulting with the railway to see if maybe there's a better surface for you. Um, if there's a lot of high trucks um, or high traffic, you might see that concrete panel. But of course, every surface has a different cost and the railway might even have maintenance constraints and might have to use a certain surface at a crossing. Um, but it's just something to consider if you're having a lot of issues with surface at a crossing to that there are different surfaces out there for you. Um, another best practice for surfaces is to delineate the roadway approaches and the crossing surface, either using curbs or line painting, et cetera. And I've seen a lot of municipalities that do apply this already. They've kind of put um, line painting just um, on the short approaches to the crossing within maybe 10 meters or 30 feet of the crossing. Um, and that's great. That just reminds a, a crossing user, this is your lane, stay in this area, just get over the crossing um, swiftly and efficiently. So that can help with safety. And another um, best practice for surface is illumination. So um, using, um, you know, street lights uh, to illuminate the crossing either in low light or night or extreme conditions or weather. Just something to consider again to support a crossing user and kind of safe passage over the over the crossing. Okay, moving on to the third S, third of the four S's is signage. So for a road authority, it's pretty cut and dry for which ones, which signs you guys are responsible for. It's that railway crossing ahead sign, uh, the speed advisory tab, if you do have a change in speed, again, if you're reducing the design speed to go over the crossing to reduce a sight line triangle or something like that, you might need a speed advisory tab and then also stop ahead sign um, if applicable. Um, and this is all based again on the TAC MUTCD. It still follows the same standards, the GCS, does uh, quote the, the MUTCD for these signs. So that was the legal requirements. And this is a big one, I think, for road authorities to consider. Uh, are the safety best practices when it comes to advance warning signage and pavement markings? So the railway can, or the road authorities can consider pedestrian focus signage, um, you know, multiple of, of train event warning signage. There are a few photos down here in the bottom right to show how there's additional signage for uh, pedestrians there. Um, and then in the bottom left hand side, if any of you have these crossings that are just the standard railway crossing sign, the SRCS without a stop sign, but it has these two trunks these two diamond signs, one being the be prepared to stop and the second one right at the cross box saying stop before crossing. This was an old, I think, scheme back in the 90s. That is the, the goal is to bring these cross this scheme to the new um, cross box with a stop sign. So if you do have any of those, um, it might be time to consider putting a stop sign on the cross box and you can work with the road with the railway on getting that stop sign installed installed on the crossback as well. 
a good opportunity to to answer a question, Lillian, is what is SRCS? Oh, sorry, SRCS is the standard railway crossing sign, which is the cross book that X, the red and white X. Uh, I guess there, those are the names for that red and white X, the standard railway crossing sign or or cross book. Okay, and then when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, regarding stop signs underneath the cross bucks, uh, whose responsibility is that? Is it the road authority or the railway? Yeah, so it's actually the railway's responsibility. So back to um, Dan's sort of responsibility chart, when the stop sign is on the the cross buck or the SRCS post. The railway is responsible for maintaining it. However, um, and that's something that I think the railways are still learning too, is that the fact that some road authorities require a uh, bylaw in order to enforce these stop signs. Um, and that's where sort of that communication between the railway and road authorities um, comes in. I, I know there might have been some short lines or smaller railroads that started just lapping up stop signs without letting a road authority know and then maybe even causing confusion. So again, we do promote that that uh, communication. If you do see that all of a sudden there's a stop sign um, up at your crossing, you know, feel free to reach out to the railway and you know reassess whether um, it's practical there because the ro the railway is probably putting up that stop sign to get that smaller sightline triangle, but they won't be familiar with your uh, traffic patterns. So you might know that even though the design speed 60 that just everybody in that area drives 80 down that road and nobody's going to be stopping no matter what stop sign gets put up there right because it brings in other challenges like enforcement and things like that so if you do see that you know as a road authority it is shared responsibility so you do have the right to kind of go to a railway and maybe question why it's up there and maybe you can work together to for better strategies um, some of the railways even have enforcement that could potentially support but i don't think they can give a ticket because it's more of a roadway um, violation if they go through but maybe just their presence there there are different strategies but it's definitely up to a roadway like a road authority don't if you see it and you want to challenge or you want to ask more questions about it yes you have the right to go to the railway to to uh, sort of ask and discuss the stop signs so, okay. Mm -hmm. okay and then um so uh, that's kind of a second point there was talking about pavement markings um, and signage at a crossing. So on the left-hand side here, you'll see an excerpt from the TAC, the MUTCD. It's also in the Grade Crossing Handbook. This figure 810, kind of showing the pavement markings for a railway crossing. So in Canada, I think we're still a little bit just getting there when it comes to signage and pavement markings at crossings, because really that's the the primary reference um, that I've seen for railway crossings. There's not much, um, but if you look at the right hand side there, we've taken an excerpt from the US Department of Transport. Um, there I have a ton of great best practices that a road authority can consider for crossings when it comes to signage and, and pavement markings. So especially this hatch, this is just an example of showing the hatched lines where you see how there's sort of different distances um, for the different approaches. So again, every crossing is a snowflake. In this case, it's looking at a crossing that's very close to a four-way intersection and how to deter um, crossing users from stopping on the tracks. Like if there is a red light, you don't want anyone stopped in that hatched area. So pavement markings can be a great visual way to address if you have queuing issues or to stop crossing users from being in a certain area if you don't want them to be for safe people. So that's a great resource to, to refer to if you're looking for safety best practices. And then the final S um, as it relates to road authorities are signals. So for road authorities, the main signal that you're responsible for if it is installed is this preemptive or advanced warning automated signal. Um, that figure 18-1A in the bottom right is taken from the grade crossing standards, um, also mentioned in the handbook, to kind of advise when you need um, an automated signal like this. And it's really if there's, if you have a very sort of curvy type road and the approach to a crossing is not direct, 
um, and maybe there's other visual obstructions. Um, this is when um, a, a signal like this is required. It does require interconnection with the railway signal, so there definitely would be conversations and collaborations required if you were looking to install um, a signal like this. And the legal requirement just is if you currently have this to, to keep, keep maintaining it and doing the periodic inspections um, as required as they're listed in the standards. And then some best practices for signals. So um, the first one was just to mention with those interconnected pre preemption sort of advanced warning flashers, just to consider the location of the electrical equipment um, and whether you as a road authority would prefer it outside of like separate from the railways cabinets. Um, just to help with maintenance. When you do have to do your inspection and testing, you won't have to call the railway, gain access. You might be able to just sort of um, work on your part of the flashers without the railway. So just to consider that if you are installing them or if you have them installed to maybe take out. If currently, if you have a system and it's in the railway cabinet, to maybe consider having it taken out of the cabinet if it helps with maintenance and just in with access. Um, and then that second bullet point might be a common one that some road authorities have been faced with, and it's adding additional flashing lights on existing railway signal masts. So there's a photo kind of down here showing you see the front lights and the back lights together, the, those four at the bottom, but then at the top you see an additional pair facing what should be um, I showed there the Huron Road and the Mill Road photo. So an additional flashing light like that might be for addressing like a mill road. If there's a access road or an intersection within 30 meters, depending on sort of the volume of traffic, but a best practice is that if I'm a vehicle coming from the mill road approach, turning right towards that crossing, I should also have a pair of lights front and back that are facing, or at least front that are facing um, my way. So that might be something that has come up um, with, you know, some road authorities may have been approached either by Transfer Canada or a railway saying that they need to add additional flashers to cover these um, intersections, maybe even driveways if there's like a, a public uh, business with a driveway there. I've even seen additional lights having to be added on. Um, so this is a, something that might come up um, and something for road, road authorities to consider um, as their current autom automated um, crossings. So, so now that you've kind of had an idea of uh, what, what could be out there for your crossings and you may want to consider, maybe I should do some improvements at my crossings um, and how can I get funding um, support for some of those improvements? Um, I'd say the most common funding program that we see out there for road authorities um, when it comes to crossings is Transfer Canada's Railway Safety Improvement Program funding where they will fund up to 50% of a project and the remaining 50% can be shared between the road authority and the railway. But as, as very important as this is, if you are interested in applying for this grant for a crossing, make sure the railway is kept in the loop of your plans. Like some of you might want to be putting up signage, um, you know, um, uh, putting in curbs and things like that. Let the railway know what you're interested in. They might even have their own improvements that they're interested in. And then you can kind of combine your work together in one project to apply for funding. And it's, it's open right now. The deadline for um, the applications is August 1st, 2020. 21. And then it's an online application. You do need to know the scope of work and estimate and things like that. Um, and again, part of can support you if you have any questions um, on how to apply. And then other potential grants. So <laughs> we're definitely not grant professionals, <laughs> but in our sort of supporting some road authorities with uh, projects, we have seen some of these funding program names pop up. Um, so it's just to encourage road authorities to see if some of their crossing improvements could apply to some of these available um, grants that we've heard of. Uh, even, for example, the Ontario Municipal Commuter Cycling Program. Um, I know 
the one authority that's been putting in um, a new cycle, little cycle path, and that meet, meant a new crossing surface um, for that cycle path, a little bit of signals work on the railway side, and that's going through that program as well. So just to keep in mind that, um, especially as road authorities, it's um, public dollars that you're um, calling on. There might be some grant funding here to support some improvements um, as well. Okay, and then finally, we'll just move into the focus topic for whistle cessation. So um, train whistling at grade crossings. So it's very important to know that the whistle of the train is a safety measure. So if you're looking to turn the whistle off, it's in a way removing a standard safety measure that's applied to all grade crossings. Um, having trains whistle at crossing, it is a requirement of the Canadian Railway Operating Rules. Um, and but we do see that um, in urban areas, um, there is that common sort of complaint of the train whistle and that there is interest to have it ceased. And Transport Canada sort of governs that process. There's a step by step process we're going to go through in the next slide on how to pursue whistle cessation. And if it is successful, um, there, there is sort of a, an agreement that goes between the road authority and railway where the whistle will be stopped. However, as again, as it is a safety measure, it's just good for municipalities to know that if there is an emergency or if there's something on the tracks, the train does still keep that, preserve that right to use the whistle um, as a safety precaution if, if needed. And so the step-by-step -step sort of process is that um, a municipality must always at first consult the railway. Again, every crossing is unique and there might be reasons why a whistle cannot be turned off at a certain crossing due to many different factors. So you'll always have to approach the railway at first um, to kind of let them know of your intent. And if the railway is, is I, I know they will never sort of like approve it, but if they have no serious objections, uh, the next step is for a municipality to provide a notification to all crossing stakeholders of the intent to pass the resolution for whistle cessation. And then the second and most important step is to conduct a crossing assessment. And the crossing assessment will look at the current conditions of the crossing and compare them to what's required for whistle cessation. cessation. Um, this is something that Parnham Health Road Authorities with. Um, we take it pretty seriously, again, because you're turning off a safety measure. There are things to look at, like trespassing in the area, just to make sure that when you do turn off that audible warning that there are still other protective um, measures in place. And once that crossing assessment is done, it will have maybe some suggestions like um, closing up fencing if there, or changing fencing if there are, you know, trespassing paths, um, installing flashing light bell and gate if that's not present. Um, and again, depending on the specifics of that crossing, there could be some additional work to be done. So once the work that is assessed or that was determined in the assessment is completed, and the railway and municipality agree that all of sort of the remediations are done, um, they can sort of move on to the next step, which is either to consult with Transport Canada for a final decision, that is optional, um, or the municipality can just go straight to pass their resolution to confirm that the whistle has been ceased. And then the railway has 30 days to um, what they'll do is sort of put a bulletin out to their railway locomotive engineers to know that these are now empty whistling. They'll put something in their sort of timetable networks to know that these crossings um, are anti whistle crossings. And then the final step, which I think some people forget is after anti whistling is the most important one, which is to maintain this, those safety conditions that allowed the whistle cessation in the first place. Um, municipalities and railways just have to keep making sure that all of those safety measures that were put in place um, are still there in good condition um, in order to keep the crossing users safe. Um, and again, everybody will receive a copy of this presentation. Um, we put some references there. <laughs> There's probably a lot more, but again, you can contact us anytime if you are looking for um, any more resources. And again, I've highlighted there the handbook since this topic was really what are your responsibilities, what are your legal requirements, that handbook's a good one to go to first. 
Um, yeah, and we would just like to sort of thank the OGRA for having us. It's been a pleasure to be here. Um, I see quite a few participants, so hopefully we've been able to educate you. Um, we are here. There's our number and our email. We love talking about trying to improve safety at crossing, so please do not hesitate to reach out to, to us at any time if you have any questions. And we can even take some questions now. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the presentation, guys. That was very informative. Um, we do have, uh, as you probably both are aware, there's a lot of questions in the in the chat box there. So, uh, and, and I mean, instead of having, instead of you know me going through them and trying to figure out what's important, why don't I let you, since there's two of you, uh, go through it, and you guys can kind of uh, go about it, and and I'll kind of I'll, I'll kind of be here watching the clock for you. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. So I think we talked about, I can go here from Frank Gross. So after Suzanne Hamilton Beach, I think we talked a little bit about your question. Yeah. About, so we covered yeah, that so, one. So we're basically at, uh, uh, how does the road authority ensure sight lines are clear on a private property? We touched on that a little bit. But, but this is a great question because even when I worked at the railway, we used to go to road authorities and say, can't you just go to the private owner and knock on his door? Like he's one of your citizens. Um, so I think there's always that challenge between the railways and road authorities of like it's it's your it's, it's your citizen and the road and the railway and the road authorities being like oh, I don't know this this guy it's his private land or 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 or, or a girl. Um, so a strategy that the railway has taken is is honestly sending letters. So I don't know how you guys feel about this. Feel free to put it in the chat. But um, if you were if you know that there's a private property owner that you know, their crops are a little bit too high all the time, or maybe there's these huge trees and you know they're an issue in your sightline triangles. Um, it's to send them a letter and you can send me us an email. We can give you the legal, you know, clauses to quote that kind of absolve a road authority from cost, because I'm sure there, that question always come up too. Okay, you want me to cut my trees down? Well, how much are you gonna give me? How much are my trees worth? These are my trees from 20 years ago. So. But there are, again, those clauses in the Railway Safety Act um, and the Canadian Transportation Act that do talk about, um, you know, sidelines being, again, that first line of defense for crossings. Um, I would start with the letter first, um, and you might even have some authority to, to cut it down if it is a really, you know, a really severe safety issue. You might even have the authority to, to do so kind of um, to, to address that. Hopefully that answers that question there. Okay. Okay. And uh, so when, when a crossing is automated, uh, is the sightline triangle reduced? Correct. So when it's automated, when you have a flashing light and bell, so not without a gate, it's correct that you don't have to have that larger triangle. It's more now from the stop site distance, which is something calculated in the, in the standards, can you see the automated warning systems, the front and back lights? So it's less about the sightline triangles when you're talking about automated signals, but more about visibility of the flashing lights and bell. If you have a crossing with the gates, like in writing black and white, there are technically no sightline requirements for crossings with gates. Um, but again, you do still need that visibility of the signals themselves. And as a safety best practice, because there's a lot of safety best practices for road authorities, um, there are sort of like limits where they they where railways and you know even transport can inspectors do kind of recommend to keep clear, you know, make sure there's not a lot of vegetation around the signals, um, kind of like keeping a clear area where you can. So okay. hopefully that uh, answers Greg's question there. Okay, okay. So is there not a requirement uh, to install stop signs at all non-automated crossings, uh, particularly in municipalities? That's correct. It's, it's, not, it's not that if you don't have, a, um, like if, if you have a passive crossing, it does not automatically have to have a stop sign. It does not. If you are able to keep that large, clear sightline triangle and like free of obstruction and you can you know, calculate that distance based on your roadway speed and the train speed. If that whole triangle is clear and you can see for miles where the train is, you do not need a, sight, a stop sign at those passive crossings. So it's not automatic that you have to have a stop sign. Okay, okay. And up to what distance uh, from the tracks are the road authorities responsible in terms of surface? 
So is there a specific measurement? So from the edge of tie, from the approaches, you would say from the edge of the railway wooden tie onwards um, is what a road authority is responsible for. So pretty keys are pretty tight for the for the railway um, that literally are just from edge of tie to edge of tie in between the rail and then the road authority is responsible for everything onwards. Okay, okay, so this next question, uh, hopefully this, this makes sense. So if you collect traffic data and have uh, vehicle classification data, is there a percentage class that would, that would dictate mm -hmm. design vehicle? Basically? So yeah, so this is a great question for the group too. This is even the fact that in the Transport Canada Handbook, it gives you some guidelines on how to select the design vehicle. Um, I personally don't know the answer to that. I will look into that for you, uh, anonymous attendee, great questions. Um, you know, and I can send the answer to Thomas because there are different strategies to decide the design vehicle. Um, and there might even be some attendees here that can answer that. Um, please feel free to give me a call or send me an email. Um, but there must be something like that. That's there has to be, you know, the TAC must have a way to um, designate the design vehicle. Again, the Great Crossing Handbook does speak to it a bit, and they must be taking some of the concepts from TAC into there. Um, but um, we'll try to find you an exact answer for that. Question. Okay. Uh, all right, so where there is more than one set of tracks that don't necessarily align and create uh, and don't create a smooth and continuous road, are there requirements to, to reprofile the tracks? Okay, so yes, yeah, Sean, I think I know you. Um, that's a good question. So again, every crossing is a snowflake. If you're dealing with tracks in a curve on a super elevation and it's not so easy to get smooth and continuous, Unfortunately, it's not so easy and just like a road authority would know as it's not so easy to realign a road, it's definitely not as easy to realign um, a railway. Um, we're actually working on a project in this, this particular case where a crossing is really in a very steep curve to the railway and it's very hard to kind of meet that smooth and continuous. Um, there is no requirement to sort of force the railway to reprofile or smooth the tracks. Road authorities can always put that request into the railway. Again, every territory is different. If it's, a, if it's like an industrial spur and there's room to do that, there could be um, a possibility too. But just to let you know, as a road authority, there's usually a minimum sort of 15% um, responsibility as well as shared responsibility. So although it might seem like it's the cost only of the railway to go and realign their tracks to get a smooth and continuous surface, um, it does affect the road authority in a way, you know, either financially or having to deal with that kind of construction. So it's definitely something that a road authority railway should get together, do an assessment, See if there's other um, strategies that can be done, maybe a little bit of realignment of both the roadway and the railway to get a better um, smooth and continuous surface, but um, definitely something to consider. But there's no, like, you can't force the railway to, to reprofile the tracks. Okay. 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 Next question. Good question. So, in my municipality, we have a railroad crossing redone by CN, and they raised the road crossing by about 30 centimeters, mm -hmm. causing a massive bump. Mm -hmm. We were going to fix the approaches by adjusting it about 20, uh, 20 centimeters on the, the road of each side, or should I be reaching out to the railway authorities to help fix this? Yeah, so uh, technically it would have been nice if they told you eh, if they were lifting the track. So that might just have been some resurfacing that they did for programs. Um, should you reach out to the railway authorities to fix it instead? You could apply for potentially RSIP funding and go to the railway and say, hey, you raised this, it's really affected our roadway profile. And now we have a lot of costs and work to do and you should loop in the railway to participate. But again, there's no way to say, you guys raised the track 30 centimeters, so you must pay fully for my road um, kind of smoothing. It's a shared responsibility, so again, um, if you are to reach out to the railway authorities, you can um, just to let them know that they're going to have to share in the work costs sort of because you'll need flagging and stuff to do to real 
sort of fix the, the roadway authority, the roadway approaches. So um, you could definitely reach out to them to sort of collaborate on, on the fix. But yeah, you can definitely say like, it's not 100% your fault um, and the road authority to take 100% of the cost for something like that. Um, there should be that collaboration between the railway and the road authority. Okay, okay, good, good. Uh, okay, so hopefully I get this next one right. So uh, a stop sign on a cross buck is not enforceable as the pavement markings do not correlate with the stop sign, but the cross buck. Yeah, but a stop sign on a cross buck is not enforceable as the pavement markings do not correlate with the stop sign. So I, I think maybe if they're if they're if they're separate, or, or maybe it, see it's a relation between a stop sign and the pavement markings, and and that kind of goes back to my comment of how some railways yeah just started putting up the sign, not thinking about the road authority side of right. the, of the stop sign, and that's why you do need that collaboration. I think that you're getting that whole collaboration kind of concept here that. If the railway does put up the stop sign, you talk to them, you both decide, yeah, the stop sign is good here. Then the road authority, if you can do your part to adjust the stop signs to make it um, enforceable, um, that might mean that the post itself might be in the wrong position if the if the stop bar, wait, is it on the pavement markings? Is it the pavement stop markings, bar? so like the yeah, stop bar, yeah. Stop bar that they're thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, that means that that might be in the wrong place. That might need repositioning. We see that a lot of stop bars. Um, being in the wrong position and even the post itself, especially for passive crossings, might be in the wrong position. So if the, if the post is in the wrong position, it's the railway's responsibility to move it. And once it gets moved, then it's the road authority's responsibility to repaint um, any sort of the pavement markings. Hopefully that helps. Right, right. Okay, so would a stop sign, uh, would um, stop signs ever be combined with automatic signals? Good question, and the answer to that is no. <laughs> no, okay. no, 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 no. If you have an automated warning signal that has a stop sign, take it off. Uh, oh, okay. is, yeah, that's a definite no. Okay, good, good. All right, so who is responsible for maintenance rehabilitation on a concrete box, so a box culvert, underneath the rail tracks? That's a good question. Now, if it is a box culvert that's owned by um, uh, fisheries or maybe even the municipality. If you own that concrete box, then um, it would be, it's shared. I would say it's shared. So there's two different types of culverts. There's the railway culverts that are fully, they were installed by the railway um, and they're made for drainage on the railway property. That's 100% a railway's responsibility. But then there are some that are owned by like ministries and you know things like that for creeks that just go under the tracks. So it's not owned by the railway. Um, that would be owned by that authority. Um, I think Austin, if you want to send me an email, but more specifics on that one, we can we can talk a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, there is that shared responsibility. Even if a municipality owns a culvert under the railway tracks and they want to rehabilitate it, they're going to have to approach the railway um, to to coordinate that work because they'll need uh, real protection against railway operations. So. Definitely need a collaboration. Kind of a case by case basis type thing, eh? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, aren't hatched pavement markings also for pedestrian control at intersections? Definitely. And this is the whole thing when it comes to road authorities and railway crossings. It's really up to you guys to decide how you want to apply your knowledge of the use of pavement markings and things like that to improve safety. And yes, I've seen them for um, cycle paths, for pedestrian paths, uh, definitely useful. Okay. Has this become a regulation for major highways? Has this become a regulation for major highways? Uh, I'm not sure that I don't understand the context behind that question, but major highways, um, shouldn't have level crossings um, because of the whole cross product. If you come to a major highway and there's a level crossing, technically it should be a, a great separation. Um, has it become regulation for major highways? Uh, Les, if you want to send us an email for more context, we can maybe dive deeper into that one. Okay, okay, good, good. So how often should municipalities review uh, painted signage and markings and uh, checking up on uh, Fading hash marks and and all of that type of stuff. Um, yeah, keeping budgets in mind. Oh, 
that's a good question, Julie. And it's really up to, I would assume that the MERT authorities have maintenance schedules, I would assume. I'd say at least every three to five years. That's kind of like a common compliance timeline, right? Every three to five years, reassess your crossings. Every three to five years, keep uh, checking up with that signage. But I even know there was that time that the MTO came up with a new reflectorization standard. Um, and I know some municipalities had to go change all their signs. So if there's also a change in you know signage requirements, that might trigger you to come, come out to do it. But I know most public works departments are the ones that are maintaining the vegetation along the ditches and kind of doing grading of roadways and that if they're going out to do that, maybe you could attach that to their job to check out the signage at the same time. Um, there are different strategies, but um, you definitely don't want to blow your budget doing it, but want to remember that you can't forget about those signs that are out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is it allowed or is it good practice to install speed cushions on the approach of roads for motorists to uh, follow the roadway posted speed sign? So I'm guessing you're thinking like um, speed bumps, something to reduce. Yeah, or the hashing for the... Um... Yeah, so this is definitely probably a roadway design question. And I guess it would depend on the speed of the road. Um, I personally have seen like crossings within residential areas that have had that do have speed bumps upon their approach, especially if you have a roadway where the vehicle is actually coming down the slope and they're going fast and it's supposed to be 50, but they're naturally going faster. I have seen that it was residential area that I've seen that, but um, you know, I don't, so I've seen that. I don't know if, the, if they were in compliance and my apologies is we can definitely look into that. My uh, specialty is not the, really the roadway design, but I can look into that, but I have seen it in the field okay okay uh okay so a grants question so can this grant be used for new pedestrian crossings so we touched on that a little bit so yeah so the rsip is a lot more broad um it used to be very specific where you couldn't um but if there's a way that you can show that your project is going to improve the safety at a crossing then there's no harm in applying and seeing, you know, and maybe you're not just, you know, you know, maybe you want to show the whole scope. Excuse me, maybe I need to know a little bit more about the scope, but it's definitely not a, a no, because we've seen it done at pedestrian crossings, because you, uh, for example, there's a project where they're improving the approaches to um, like a path of trail crossing. And that's definitely eligible because you're improving the safety at that crossing. And so uh, that improvement program funding should apply. Okay. And then what about grade separation projects? Yeah. So grade separations, unfortunately, they're not covered in that grant funding. So it's a good question in the fact that grade separations do cost a lot of money. Um, but unfortunately, they're not seen as like R6 for like level crossing projects um so yeah unfortunately not uh okay okay so another good question here so grade crossing regulations say that the road authority is responsible for the design of the crossing surface and the railway is responsible for other aspects of the crossing surface does this mean that the road authority can dictate material used concrete? yeah you can recommend so that's a good question um you can't force them but for example, if a, if a railway says, you know what, we think wood is good, and um, the road authority says, no, we know there's heavy traffic, we would like concrete, the railway, you know, might just say, okay, for sort of maintenance purposes, we'll meet you halfway, we'll give you the money for sort of the wood surface, can the road authority pay that difference? Like, again, every crossing is different, or maybe the railway might say, actually, yeah, we agree with you, we should upgrade this to concrete, and they might be able to meet halfway. Um, it's definitely a discussion to have and a road authority, um, as it is your crossing users, like, you know, um, that are using the crossing, you definitely have a say. I would definitely try to negotiate something. If you, if you know they're putting something and it just keeps getting ripped up and you're tired of all the maintenance, I would definitely start that conversation. Okay. Uh, the next question here, uh, and we won't answer it because we don't have all of uh, all of the information, but any suggestions on how to move a design forward and get the necessary approvals through through a rail authority, um, shoot us an email, um, yeah, shoot us an email, get get in contact with us and we'll we'll give you kind of a little bit of more of a review. 
And yeah, that's unfortunately a common thing. It's hard to get a hold of the railways. You have to remember that a railway, their primary oper um, goal is railway operations. So any projects that have to do outside of operations kind of falls in the wayside. And over the years, the resources at railways have been cut significantly to what they used to be before. And because of that, I think road authorities are now being faced with having to be responsible for things that maybe before the railway used to do out of like handshake agreements and things. And now that they have less resources and there are these new regulations, it's true, I'm sure road authorities are seeing like, I've never had to take care of this before, um, but now it's sort of all coming out in the, in the woodwork. Okay. But yeah, you can send us an email or a question yeah. about that. We'll need to know who the railway authority is and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so who is responsible for drainage at a grade crossing? For example, there may be a culvert uh, going under the road and conveys drainage from railway ditches or vice versa. So that's kind of similar to the to the answer we already answered there. Yeah, you gave like if it's drainage along the roadway right away, it's the roadways right away. But if it's drainage along the railway right away, so meaning the ditch is parallel to the tracks, that's usually the railway and anything parallel to the roadway should be the rail three. Someone also put a comment there about the OMCC program. So thank you for sharing that with the group. Okay, so at a previous grade crossing training day, uh, the presenter mentioned that each crossing has an ID number and crossing details page. I don't remember uh, what the details page is called and where it would be accessible. Yes, so yes, Ryan, great question. And in the very first uh, where we put our agenda, we had a snapshot of something called the Rail Canadian Rail Atlas. So if you want to shoot us an email, we can send you the proper links, but all of this, there are public um, lists of crossings that Transport Canada has, um, that the RAC, the Rail Railway Association of Canada has, that will have these numbers. Um, it's just about knowing which links it is. So if any of you are interested in, in that, let us know. We can provide you with the proper links there. Okay. Okay, are there any situations where whistle sensation would not be considered to be not feasible from the point of view of the railway? Yeah, there would be. Like, again, every crossing is different and depending on the location of the crossing or maybe the environment, what's developed around, um, maybe there, you know, uh, maybe in history at a crossing for incidents, um, that could deter a railway from wanting to turn the whistle off. Like, if there's a crossing where there's people that are, there's a lot of near misses or a lot of trespassing, um, a railway would consider you know, might, like I can't speak for all the railways, but it would maybe deter a railway from being on board with getting on in this, an assessment, um, or it might even get a railway to really consider, okay, what are some of the controls we need to put in place if we do want to, to put the, to, to turn off the whistle, so. Okay. Okay, so is the, the railroads or the regulators going to implement more safety measures for private crossings, private crossings being um, under three dwellings or private business type crossing? Mm -hmm. So the railroad authority might, and it's true. I think there's a few private crossings now that are being affected by some of the Metrolinx developments. And it's really up to a railroad authority to do a proper crossing assessment. And if you're of the private crossing owner, I would definitely you know, try to get involved in that assessment to give them the proper details to do that assessment. But railroads could be going to do assessments at private crossings currently that have no signage, no lights, and they might, depending on the results of their assessment, um, determine that they require lights. So something that could affect that is multiple tracks. So if you know of a private crossing right now that's a single track, and has no signs, no lights, putting in a second track, depending on the railway speed and other conditions, could um, result in there having to be, a, or having it become an automated um, crossing. And when a crossing turns to automated crossing, there are maintenance costs and uh, other responsibilities to think about, but uh, a, a great crossing assessment would have to be done um, before they sort of change uh, the conditions that are crossing. Okay. Uh, okay, good question for you. So the, um, are there any current best practices where a pedestrian or cyclist crossings that involve gates 
Um, we have current issues with gates making it difficult for bikes and trailers and mm -hmm. and stuff like that to cross, uh, particularly at a, a Trans Canada trail crossing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So great question, Jennifer. There used to be Trans for Canada pedestrian guidelines that um, kind of are, don't really exist anymore. Um, and I see that with pedestrian gates, it's true, it might make people want to run through. Same thing, this would require a grade crossing assessment. Uh, you can give us a call, we can maybe just chat about it over the phone. Um, but uh, a pedestrian gate is supposed to, you know, deter people from crossing, but depending on the railway line, if the railway speed is slow, it might actually encourage people to try to chase, you know, try to make it before that that gate closes so we can cause other issues for there being a gate um but there are definitely some you know i can even if you want to send us an email send you some links there have been some studies on pedestrian crossings done in some other provinces um as well as the the um, um the us the dot has some some resources too for pedestrian and stuff so if you want to send us an email we can definitely Okay. 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 Lillian, you'll like this question. So has there been any improvements in the railway's ability to provide flaggers when the road authority is working uh, in close proximity to a crossing? Um, no real improvements, I guess. Is it trying to say if they have flagging resources? Great question, Max. And I wonder if it's Matt McDonald that, that <laughs> I know. Um, unfortunately, again, the resources at that the railways, at least the, the class ones I know of, are still very scarce. And again, because their mandate is the operation of trains, I do know that road authorities you do have issues or troubles with um, sort of getting flagging. The best I can say is try to give it most advanced warning as you can, advance notice. If you even have one day of inspection that you know is coming in six months from now, you know, maybe start reaching out to some of the railway people. Like it sounds a bit um, over the top there, but again, the railways are pretty slim on resources. So just try to do advance for uh, as, as you can. And most of them should have a process in place where you fill out a permit and things like that, a right away entry permit. So there should be a way, hopefully, that they can meet your needs. Okay, why is there no mention of board orders and responsibilities of maintaining the crossing surface? Mm -hmm. So this is good. This is kind of something we didn't really want to get too deep into, which is crossing ownership. And that's correct. When it comes to knowing what a road authority is responsible for at a crossing, there's something called the board order, which would have been the original agreement when the crossing came into place that would say, Road authority, you're 50% responsible for the signals. Railway, you're 50%, or road authority, you're 100%, and railway. So these are um, orders that are managed by the Canadian Transportation Agency. Um, please comment why there's no mention. And maybe that's why you're wondering why we didn't mention it. We kind of don't really want to get too much into that. Um, if you do have questions specifically about crossings and the board orders, maybe you're looking for them, you can go to the Canadian Transportation Agency or even the railway to look for the agreements themselves. Hopefully the road authority has copies of, of their um, board orders for the crossings as well. But that's correct, Matthew. Like that is what deems who's responsible for what at level crossings, the board orders. Okay. Uh, so does your firm provide uh, all support for aspects of grade crossing regulation, evaluation, and advising and reporting, uh, providing minimums and best practices? Sure. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, so of do. course, of our, course, our that's what we do. Our safety assessments talk about compliance, and then we also, so we, it's like there's compliance assessments, there's also safety assessments, so we kind of merge them. Here's your compliance must black and white do, and here are some best practices uh, for crossing so we do that. Yeah, of course. Uh, okay, so... Uh, are we Thomas over time? There? Yes, Thomas, are you still there? Are we still yeah. okay to go? Keep going. Or? Yeah, so, okay, so funny enough, we normally do this just for an hour, but I think we accidentally booked it for an hour and a half, and there's so many questions. I've never seen this level of engagement before, so I'm just kind of letting you guys run with it, and we still have, okay. like, over, like, 100, 170 people here, so. Great, yeah. great. I don't know yeah. so much about railway. We probably only touched about a little bit. We'll keep going with the questions. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so if there are potholes, poor pavement conditions at the tracks, municipality maintains up to the rail and the railway maintains between the tracks. So between the rails is is uh, is the terminology to use there. And if there's multiple tracks, then uh, the road authority would still have to maintain the road surface 
between the two tracks if there's multiple tracks. And again, I but, think I mentioned before, sometimes they collaborate yeah. just because it's such a small, usually it's a tight space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, how did tourism only rail corridors impact the standards? So that's a good point. So kind of didn't really get into this, but the grade crossing regulations are only for federally regulated railways. So when you come to local and tourism railways, technically they're under the MTO or the local municipality and what those standards are to be. Even Metrolinx in a way is not a federally regulated railway per se because they're passenger sort of the uh, you know local to to um, the the mto um so they follow the transport canada regulations as a best practice and there's a whole level of understanding there's like a whole connection as to why they do try to because they try to be safe but small tourism railway if they're not running on federally regulated tracks um they should be following these standards and these best practices, um, but Transport Canada won't be going out to inspect those those railways, the local ones. But Patrick, send us an email if you have a specific question to give more context on that one. Okay, so when an accident occurs on a, on a railway crossing with a patch, uh, are both parties liable? Ooh. Oh, we're not an insurance company, and I guess it would depend <laughs> when I think there's a railway crossing with a patch. I'm guessing they mean there's a patch in the railway crossing. You could go back to, hey, which which pace has the patch? Was it the road authority's approach, or was it in between the rails? And that could come into play. Um, but I'm sure with with accidents, there's you know the Swiss cheese effect. There's probably so many different factors that come into play that um, it would be case by case really but sort of that both parties liable thing is that whole feeling of the regulations and the new standards of yes there is collaboration gone are the days of you know it's just the railways kind of problem or just the roadways problem but there is always that uh, collaboration okay so uh is there any time requirements for a railway to respond um particularly it took Quite a quite a few months there for track protection. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know. Who could you escalate to? That's a good question. Reach out to us. Reach out to us with your your specific municipality, and if we know the if we know the railroad. And again, yeah. with the railways, it is it is tight. If you know, you could if it is a real safety issue, you could potentially escalate to Transport Canada. They are on your side. When I worked there, I never got any phone calls. I would have loved to get phone calls to Lord authorities when I was there. Um, and now that Lord authorities are more named in the regulations, I think we're going to see Transfer Canada becoming a little bit more involved. Not that I want to give them more of this sort of work, but unfortunately, there is nowhere to escalate. The railways are their own companies and their own organizations. Uh, you just got to keep trying. It's definitely a test of persistence. I think even Matt McDonald's bringing that up. It's just a, it's just a. Unfortunately, in the nature of the game or, or of the industry, sorry. Okay. Um, so, is there a, a reference that we could provide to farms uh, and farmers for, for farm crossings? Yes, there, there are. And Heather, if you want to send me an email. So Operation Lifesaver, I think we also skipped uh, Doug Laws oh. there, but um, um, if you want to send us an email. So Operation Lifesaver, also Googleable, is a railway safety um, sort of uh, organization. And they do have handouts for all different kinds of things, pedestrian crossings, farm crossings, things like that. So if you want to send us an email, um, you can, we can send you some of those links. Um, and those are great things, again, to sort of put in the farmer's uh, mailboxes or you can mail out to your farmer owners. So the regulations do not cover farm crossings. But uh, again, they can be looked at as a safety best practice when it comes to applying to those. Okay, uh, so I skipped one here. So how, how far away from the, the railway ties or the or the, the rail do you need um, to complete road repairs? Without flagging, yes. Yeah, so oh, sorry, yes. Yet. 
Yeah, so I think some railways say like that their road, that their um, right of way is about um, 50 feet wide. Again, it changes in different areas. Sometimes it's 100 feet, sometimes it's less. So if you're 25 feet from center line of track, I would definitely say you need a flagger. So, and especially because the road authority is responsible right up to the edge of tie. Unfortunately, those types of repairs will require the, the flag person there. Okay. So if we have a rail corridor where uh, only low speed tourism train runs, do any of the standards change? Yeah, I think we talked a little bit about this. Um, so again, it is a tourism train. It's not federally regulated. Um, there are, you know, you can look at their regulations as a best practice. So it's not to say that, hey, they don't have to do anything, but it's not as enforceable as it would be for a federally regulated railway. Um, you're only going to be sure to do the standards change at all. No, but the standards are there for safety for at any crossing. So they could, they should still be referenced uh, for safety. And again, Patrick, if you have specific questions, send us a note, give us a call. Okay. Uh, so I've been informed by the police, uh, do not stop on track signs are required um, for, for them, them to enforce. enforce. Oh. So okay. these signs are not regulatory. So I'm not sure if this is true. Uh, does it apply in this case whether or yes, not signs, signs are, are present? present? I know we should write this down. There's a couple of questions that we're going to follow up on. Again, unfortunately, we're not um, yeah. enforcement, roadway enforcement. Um, and I'm sure there's kind of mixed messages on this. Does the Highway Traffic Act apply in this case whether or not signs are present? I wonder if that uh, police officer was just saying, like, there's you that, uh, you know, road authority must advise, the, you know, in order to enforce something that just shows some sort of due diligence that you did advise and maybe that do not stop on track signs part of it. Um, yeah, I, I can't officially reply to that, but it's a good question. Um, Sometimes a good assessment is is uh, is key it. for just checking in on the queuing and stuff like that based around the, the crossing. Yeah, but David, we'll look into that um, and, and get back to you. Okay, another queuing question. So are, are pre-signals for queuing part of uh, the regulations that come into effect in November? Free signals for queuing. Now, Stephen, I don't know if you're able to type some more context in there or maybe give us a call for that because um, I'm not sure what you mean by free signals. Do you mean signage or, um, yeah, it would have to be signage for queuing, I think. Um, maybe give us a call or send us an email if okay. you have more context on that one. Okay. Um, uh, so are contracts uh, required between the railway and the road authority when establishing cost sharing responsibilities and the maintenance responsibilities? Are yeah. these details included anywhere? So David, this is back to um, someone who was kind enough to mention a board order. So if your, your crossing should have a board order, if it doesn't, it would have a maintenance agreement. And in that agreement, it should have a cost sharing responsibility. Um, when it comes to what's specified in the regulations or the laws, it tells you what concepts who each person is responsible for. But when it comes to the costing itself, that's something between the road authority and railway in particular. Okay, so if a railway crosses a municipal drain, is the railway responsible to share in the cost of the maintenance of the drain and uh, uh, crossing under any provincial drainage mm -hmm. act? I guess it depends on who was there first. That's kind of how crossings work. Was the drain there before the railway came? In that case, maybe the railway would be responsible. But if the railway was there and the drain came after, um, that's a good question. I can we can look into this too. I'm not too sure about the provincial drainage act and things like that. But um, maybe David too, if you want to send us some more context in an email for both these questions, we can look into it a little bit more for you. Okay. Uh, whistle cessation can be implemented if gates, lights, and a bell are present. Uh, that is the requirement in the standards, um, but again, a proper assessment must be done. So it might be gates, lights, bell present plus additional things based on the assessment, um, but that's definitely a first step um, or definitely minimum sort of requirement for whistle cessation. <clears throat> Okay, so another good question. So if uh, if there are agreements or uh, crossing agreements or orders supersede regulatory framework? Yeah, I guess that's a good question to them. So like what if uh, there is an agreement that says the road authority is actually responsible for the surface in between the rails? Would that supersede what's in the regulations? 
Um, and I guess, again, it would depend on this, the circumstances. It's, it's definitely hard to say. If you have the clause like that in your agreements, I would refer to Transfer Canada to or the CTA to clarify um, usually what it is. I, I think a lot of these board orders have been made way, way, really like a really long time ago. Some are like really oldly dated. And I know with the new regulations, there's sort of been conversations about how some of those not that they might not apply, but they do require update. Um, and you know, when they are being updated, I'm sure they will reference the new regulations. So it's it's, it's kind of a case by case type thing. And again, every crossing is different. Something to discuss with the railway, Transport Canada, and or the CTA. Okay, is there a legal document that outlines the responsibilities? Uh, in these agreements. Oh, is there a little bit that outlines the responsibilities? Yes, if you mean the responsibilities like we kind of went through in the presentation, mm -hmm. yes, the regulations do. Um, and announcement attendee at 2 p.m., you can send us an email, we can send you the links. Um, but yes, it does outline kind of the responsibilities we were talking about. Okay, so pre warning devices and lights on major highways is this acceptable? and new regulation. New regulation, pre-warning devices, lights off major highways. So if you're talking about those pre-exemption um, um, pre or advanced, uh, railway advanced warning lights that the roadway will put on, the road authority will put on upon the roadway approach. Um, and when you mean major highways, if you mean like kind of not a freeway, but you know, the, some of those fast ones, then yes, again, we've seen those applied. Um, again, in the regulations and the standards explains when to install those. So if you have a particular crossing with certain conditions, you wanna give us some more context, we can give you some more guidance on, on that too. If you're thinking about installing one and you're not too sure, send us a note, we can help you with that. Okay, so is there a plan to implement smart signs? Uh, for example, microelectronics, so they have, uh, so they can communicate with crossing status with AVs. Um, smart signs. I'm not too sure. Is there a plan to implement smart signs? So they can communicate crossing status with AVs. What's an AV? Uh, I'm not sure what an AV is. Autonomous vehicle. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yes, I have heard <laughs> about this. And actually, I don't know if some of you use their, your, um, um, GPS or to go somewhere. Sometimes you hear Google say approaching railway crossing. So I'm not sure about smart signs, but I do know uh, I've been to a couple of conferences pre-COVID where people are thinking of other ways to warn drivers or uh, approaching vehicles. It would apply to tons of vehicles as well as to whether a train is coming. That would be great if an autonomous vehicle just knew to stop at a crossing when a train was coming, but uh, it's definitely something innovative and hopefully in the future we'll see some. But it's not really our wheelhouse okay. uh, expertise. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Okay, so should the road authority uh, be on the rail authority to fulfill their obligations uh, with all the signage and, and uh, emergency notification signs if the rail authority do not fulfill their obligations before the date in November. Yeah, does the road, yeah, so correct. If you know of some crossings or maybe you haven't even gotten that information, if you never got that information sharing from the railway, technically that's like non-compliance and they should be giving you that information. The same would apply to any of the things that are presently required. If you know that that cross book, the red and white X, it's not reflectorized or it's in really poor condition, yes, you should go to the railways to advise them that they need to, you know, fulfill their obligations for sure. You can, yeah, I see Thomas has come on, so. Yeah, so I, yeah, if we, now we are at time. I know, so like I mentioned, I think we, there was, there might've been a scheduling mistake, but I've never seen so many questions asked in, in a, any of these webinars before. I figured we just let it run. Lots yeah. of informative, lots of informative stuff in your presentations. I think the question and answer was even super informative too. Not, maybe not even just for the, you know, for everyone, like just for me as well, I was just here, uh, just taking it all in. This is this was really uh, great. So I want to, I just want to thank uh, the two of you, uh, Daniel and Lillian, for taking the time uh, to to come here today. And you know what was a webinar, and then turned into and asked me anything. Uh, this this was really really uh, a wealth of information uh, for everyone watching. Thank you for uh, for asking all those wonderful questions. Um, you know how to get in touch with uh, Daniel and Lillian at Partum. Uh, you know, it's, it's over there on the screen. 
Um, if, you, if you asked a question and wanted to follow up, be sure to do that. Uh, Daniel and Lillian will be sending the presentations, I believe. We'll also have this up on OGRA's YouTube channel uh, within 24 hours. So be sure to check that out if you want to rewatch it again or share it with someone else. Um, but on that note, um, we'll wrap up and thank you everybody uh, for being here. Take care.